All right, thank you so much, Bell Choir. That was wonderful. Hey, I just got a message that uh, Children's Church is going to be canceled today, but I'm seeing the sign. I'm reading mix. Yes, we are good to go. All right, Sean says it's good to go. So Children's Church, you are dismissed. Of course, you're always welcome to stay with us. We love to have you in big church. Uh, you're welcome to do that. Some are fleeing as though their lives depend on it. <laughs> I assure you, no fire alarm has gone off. Please do not. <laughs> all right, so there is Children's Church. If they all start flooding back, I guess we'll know I made the wrong call, but apparently there is. So, well, let's, um, let's do this. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Jonah, but I'm only going to read one verse today, so I might be done with the reading of God's Word before you find it. If you're slow... Find it anyways, because we're going to refer back to this and other places in the Word of God as we progress through the sermon this morning. So, uh, book of Jonah, chapter 1, let's stand up for the reading of the Word of God. God's Word is holy, it is infallible, it is inerrant, perfect in every possible way, the authority for the church and for the world, and we believe it with our hearts. So, Jonah, chapter 1, one verse today, verse 17 and it reads this, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the great fish for three days and three nights. Let's pray. Father, your word does ask us to believe things at times that would seem to be impossible. Your word asks us to believe, for instance, that people were healed by the word of Jesus instantly and completely. Your word asks us to believe that one time in the book of Kings, uh, the head of an iron axe fell into the water and by the miracle of the prophet it floated, and we believe it. And your word requires us to believe that Jesus, our Savior, died truly dead and yet was raised again to new life, and we do believe and confess the gospel. So, Father, as difficult as Jonah 1.17 may seem to be for us to believe Yet we confess that it is true, and we ask for your Holy Spirit now to come and to help us as we discuss these things. In the name of Jesus, we pray, and all God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you very much. You may be seated. How many of you have seen the movie The Princess Bride? I'm told that's a well-known movie. We watched it for the first time uh, as a family a couple Fridays ago. Now we've, what? It's a good movie. Uh, now we've seen, we've seen uh, some of us have seen The Princess Bride, but the kids had not seen it as a family, and so we watched it uh, for the first time. Great movie. It's a, kind of a silly story about a soon-to-be princess and a, and a swashbuckling, uh, sword-wielding hero. And if, uh, if you have not seen the movie, it features Andre the Giant from Wrestling Lore. You remember him? in his would-be Oscar role, but alas, he did not win the Oscar for his performance that year. Great movie, though, and a pretty clean movie, by the way, I might, I might also add on top of that. But one of the things that people like about the movie is it's so quotable. Uh, what is your favorite quote from The Princess Bride? Turn to somebody right now and tell them what you like about the movie. How many of you like it when, when Wesley falls down the hill and he says, as you wish? Remember that line? I say that to my wife every time I wash the dishes, as you wish. And then, of course, uh, there's Inigo Montoya. My name is Inigo Montoya. You killed my father. Prepare to die. That's right. And then, and then uh, everybody remembers the, uh, the Brainiac. What is the, the name of the Brainiac? The really smart guy. Is it, is it Vizzini? Is that right? Something like that? He's always going around saying, inconceivable. In fact, uh, we stirred up a clip of that. If we could, if we could hit play on that, I just want to want you to see. Inconceivable, inconceivable, inconceivable. You keep using the word. I don't think it means what you think it means. You keep using that word. I don't think you know what it means. Well, uh, we are in the process of studying the book of Jonah here at Faith Church, and uh, if you missed last week, by the way, Pastor Dave. Man, he preached an incredible sermon from a strange and bizarre, slightly gross, but glorious and beautiful passage. If you missed that one, go on YouTube and find it. Uh, but we've been now studying the book of Jonah for a couple of weeks, and one of the things that I've tried to stress in our book, uh, book study is that while many people think that the book of Jonah is actually a children's story, 
It's really not. Uh, the theological content of the book of Jonah, the, uh, the book as a literary unit is really rather profound. And so we're trying to go a layer deeper as we study the book of Jonah. So what I'd like you to do right now is humor me. I want everybody to reach underneath your seats. And aside from a flotation device, you will find a thinking cap right underneath you. So go ahead and pull that out. And let's put those thinking caps on right now. Because I want to talk to you about uh, the concept of impossibility today. Uh, or in the words of Vizzini, inconceivable, he would say, about the book of Jonah. Now we inside the church, we love the book of Jonah. We've made a thousand VBSs about this book. We've, uh, we've done Veggie Tale episodes galore about the book of Jonah. But if, if you're not aware, outside the church, the book of Jonah has become somewhat of a pinata in the unbelieving world. The book of Jonah has become somewhat of a straw man by which unbelievers and skeptics will sometimes critique uh, our scriptures, the word of God, and they'll, they'll point to Jonah or maybe Noah's Ark or a few of the other more difficult stories in the Bible, and they say, see, look, are you telling me that you actually believe, like you, you all actually believe that a man was swallowed by a whale and survived for three days? And they would look at us and they would say, inconceivable, right? Or in, in the more popular parlance, they might tell us that that is simply impossible. And so we want to talk about impossibility today. Uh, and the first thing I would want you to know, by the way, is that when we talk about impossibility, let's go ahead and make a, a technical distinction between what is impossible in a, in, a, in a philosophical sense and that which is merely improbable or unlikely or hard to believe. Those are two different categories. I might say, for instance, that uh, I can't meet with you on Tuesday mornings. It's impossible because I have staff meeting every Tuesday morning. Uh, but when I use the word impossible, that way I'm using it in a more generic sense. I'm not using it in its technical, philosophical sense. I may, I may say to you, gentlemen, it is impossible to answer the question, do these genes make me look fat? Don't try to answer that question. It's, impo it's impossible. Uh, but again, I'm, I'm not using that word in the technical philosophical sense. When we speak of impossibility, uh, thinking caps on, we're talking about a situation in which there are no possible scenarios, no possible circumstances that may attend a given event's occurrence, okay? So uh, impossibility means that there is no circumstance, no situation in which a given event could possibly take place. And so uh, if I were to say to you that uh, I know of a four-sided triangle, well, that would be technically and logically impossible because a four-sided triangle is contrary to its own definition. That's impossible. Um, if I said that two plus two equals seven, that is impossible as far as we uh, understand the way that God created this particular universe. If I were to say to you that a mortal man can flap his arms and fly like a bird, at least here on planet Earth with our gravity, that is impossible. There are no circumstances under which a given event can take place. That is impossibility in its technical sense. And so uh, what we want to do today is, is simply this. Um, we're going to examine uh, Jonah chapter 1 verse 17 and ask a simple question, is this possible or is it not? And what I would like to do is I'm going to give you two responses from Matt Everhard today. That's, that's yours truly. And then we're going to consult the uh, opinion of an expert witness, which we'll summon to, uh, to give testimony in a little bit. Uh, so two points from me and then one point for an expert witness, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, first main point is simply this. When, when we consider this event, Jonah 1.17... One of the factors that we should bring into the equation is the limitation of human knowledge, all right? The limitation of human knowledge. You know, we don't know everything. Uh, you may sit next to somebody right now who thinks they do, but hit them with an elbow right now and look at them and say, you don't know everything. Uh, there is a limitation to human knowledge. In fact, let's go back to the Bible. If you closed it, that was a mistake here at Faith Church. Bible's open. Let's look at the verse again, 117. And the scripture says that the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Now that's the English standard version that I'm preaching to you this morning. The Lord appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah. Now if you Google this 
and you talk to any number of internet skeptics out there online, you're going to see a plethora of responses to this verse in which uh, the skeptic on his keyboard will simply tell you this is impossible because as everybody knows, the esophagus of a whale is only a few inches in diameter and whales cannot, they do not have the ability to actually swallow a mortal being. And there are thousands of trolls online, skeptics that will bring up this fact, the esophagus of most whales do not permit the swallowing of a human being. Well, if you look at your, your Bible again, and the ESV actually nails it on this one, it says a great fish, it doesn't say a whale. And that is actually the proper translation of the Hebrew term. The Hebrew term does not specify a whale or any other species for that matter. It's really a rather general aquatic creature term, a great fish. And so uh, the term can very easily mean a whale, doesn't rule it out. Uh, it could just as easily mean a shark or even a large fish of a more traditional type, the Goliath fish, for instance. But it doesn't make any claims whatsoever about the specificity of the species of type of sea creature. Uh, so if somebody were to tell you, look, it's impossible, it's impossible for a whale to swallow a human being because of the size of their esophagus, well, uh, what they're trying to do in, on that occasion is they're trying to do what's called proving a universal negative. Now hang with me, this is important. A universal negative is when you make a truth claim and you say, uh, there is no such possibility that fits the category in which we're currently discussing. So, for instance, if I were to say uh, that I know that there is no gold in China, what I'm doing in terms of logical argument is I'm trying to defend a universal negative. Now, the problem with that is that universal negatives are very difficult to sustain, and they're actually very easy to overturn because to disprove a universal negative, all you need to do is cite one possible scenario in which uh, the category is overturned. So for instance, if I want to overthrow the statement, there is no gold in China, what do I need to do? Well, all I need to do is find one piece of gold in China, and that destroys the statement of there is no gold in China, the universal negative has been defeated. You see how that works? So if somebody's going to argue that they know that there is no such fish that fits this category, they're trying to defend a universal negative, and unfortunately, philosophically, that's a very difficult proposition to do. It's easier for us as believers to overturn that notion, and here's how we would do that. We would simply say, well, uh, if you're going to argue for a universal negative that there is no such fish that can swallow Jonah, you would first of all have to know every possible fish in the Mediterranean Sea today. You'd have to know every one of them. Not a lot of people have that knowledge. But not only that, you would not only have to know every fish in the Mediterranean Sea today, you would also have to know every fish in the Mediterranean Sea when? Well, yeah, well, almost 3,000 years ago when this event took place. And so you're, you see how much knowledge the skeptic is plain, claiming here to have mastered in his own mind. He, he knows, he says, every possible species in order to say there is no such one that fits the category. Well, that's a pretty difficult argument to sustain. Not only that, but the Mediterranean Sea, as we know, because we know our Google Maps, the Mediterranean Sea opens up into the Atlantic Sea through a strait called the Strait of Gibraltar. And so you would also be making a truth claim to know not only every fish that lived 3,000 years ago in the Mediterranean, but also the entire Atlantic Ocean, and for that matter, we might as well add in with the rest of the world as well. And so that's a massive truth claim they're asserting to know. And unfortunately, uh, although the world's surface is over 70% water, uh, the National Oceanic Administration, or NOAA, tells us that less than 5%, less than 5%, has actually been studied in any in-depth kind of a way. And so you see what the problem here is, is simply this. To say that we know that there is no such fish that could swallow a man is a massive truth claim that unfortunately would be very difficult for the skeptic to sustain. So let's do a little ichthyology this morning. Do you all, do you all know what ichthyology is? All right, we, normally we teach theology here in this 
in this setting, but today we're going to do some ichthyology, which is the study of fish. And uh, what I simply did is I simply googled the question with two categories. Number one, is there any fish that is able physically, with, does it have the anatomy to actually swallow a human being alive or whole? And then simply another category, do any of them live in the Mediterranean Sea? That's all I did. And so I found uh, that there are a number of great fish that can have the capability to swallow a human being, including a, tar a tiger shark. A tiger shark has been known to swallow a, a dolphin whole. There was a case in which a nine-foot tiger shark swallowed a seven-foot dolphin. I don't know how that happened, but it, apparently it did. But it doesn't live in the Mediterranean, so I'm going to rule that out. Uh, and your skeptic is right. The average blue whale, the average humpback whale does not have the esophagus capacity to swallow a human being, although they do live in the Mediterranean Sea. So I'll set that possibility aside. And what I stirred up is three possibilities of fish that can meet both criteria. Uh, the killer whale uh, lives in the Mediterranean and can swallow a human being, as can a great white shark. Did you ever picture that when you read the book of Jonah before? That's a possibility. And not only that, but the sperm whale is the one whale that does have the esophagus capacity to swallow a mortal. And so you do have at least some capabilities of animals meeting both criteria, the Mediterranean Sea and the anatomical capacity to swallow a human being. So we've already overturned the universal negative because we've cited at least three possibilities. And here's the good part. We don't even have to need to know which one it is. Why not? Because we've already shown that the universal negative cannot be by citing at least three possibilities. Well, here's the problem. The problem when we say we know what's possible is that we're in the dangerous territory of human arrogance. Because the higher truth claims we claim to know as human beings, uh, the more human pride and arrogance it does take to make these great assertions. Now, I will not deny, and I'll be the first one to admit, that human knowledge today on planet Earth is greater than it ever has been before. We have knowledge of chemistry. We have knowledge of medicine. We have knowledge of physics. We have knowledge of thermodynamics that surpasses any other period in human history, and we're only getting smarter. But when we begin to tell God, right? When we begin to tell God what is and is not possible in the world that he created, then we're verging into the very nefarious territory, the very dangerous territory of human arrogance and pride. We can't tell God what is and is not possible in the universe that he, that he created, that he determined to be so. First of all, we've got a human limitation of knowledge problem. But secondly, I want to I draw your attention to uh, perhaps uh, a stronger argument for us Christians. You know, we can argue all day, can't we? And you probably have tried this. You can argue all day with a skeptic about certain things, and they, they just move on. They're, it's like trying to, you know, stick a knife in a pebble. It just keeps moving underneath you. Well, the second thing that I want to bring up is the absolute sovereignty of God and divine possibility when it comes to his word. He is, after all, God. He can do things that defy your understanding. He can do things that defies my capability of understanding, for goodness sakes. And so let's go back to the Bible another time. I want to look at this verse carefully once more. And, and look at what the Bible actually teaches here, 117. It says, the Lord, what? He appointed a great fish to swallow up Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. Now, while the skeptic is pleased to argue with us about the esophagus or the esophaguses or the esophagi or whatever the plural is of, of whales, the Christian says, wait, you skipped over a word. But because before we get to what kind of fish this is, let's remember who we're talking about here. Uh, the subject of the sentence here is that the Lord appointed a great fish. And in this case, we're talking about the sovereignty of God as the creator of the universe. Now, I, I, I want to I bring something up here that has always made sense in my mind as a, as a Christian believer my, myself. Somebody told me this one time, made so much sense, I'm just like, yes, that's right. 
And I forget who said it. Uh, if it's you, I'll give you the credit for it. But somebody one time said, or maybe I read it, if Genesis 1-1 is true, you know Genesis 1-1, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. If Genesis 1-1 is true, then th there is no verse or chapter in the Bible that we cannot believe. That is impossible for us to believe. If it is true that God created the heavens and the earth, then every other verse, as difficult as it may seem, the objections stirred up by some of these more difficult passages, they just melt before the sovereignty of God. I mean, think about this. I mean, reason with me here. If God designed the synapses in your human brain that can record volumes of volumes of information and the memories that you process every single day, if God can design the synapses that jump through your brain, if God can design the cornea of the human eye which interprets light and color and, and, and can see these great sights with the eye, if God can design that, then what in the world is to say that, that Jesus, God in the flesh, can't say to a blind man, see again, and it, and it happens? If God is the creator of the universe, he made the Milky Way galaxy. If God created the sun and the, and the, 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 the stars and the planets, and if God owns all things, even all the way down to the, the, the small cells in our bodies, if God can design these things, then what is to say that in 2 Kings chapter 6, that iron axe head couldn't float because God determines in his own will and decree to overturn the laws of gravity for that moment? What, what's to say? If, if Genesis 1-1 is true, then every other verse and chapter of our Bibles becomes possible because of divine sovereignty. Does this make sense to you? Now, somebody will still say, okay, but I don't believe in axe heads floating. I don't believe in blind men seeing. I don't believe of guys called Lazarus getting out of tombs. That doesn't happen in the naturalistic realm. You see, I, I'm a naturalist. I'm a materialist. I'm an objective thinker. I must be compelled by reason to believe that which I believe. If somebody says that, that they rule out the, the supernatural a priori as a category, I just don't go there, then how do we respond? Well, sometimes rationalists or materialists or naturalists, they will tell you that they are the ones who are the objective thinkers. They are the ones who have the corner on rationality. I disagree with that. Here's why. Objectivity implies that you are open to explanation, right? That's what the word objective means. If I'm an objective thinker, I am open to possibilities and I think and process information objectively. Well, the naturalist really isn't as objective as he claims to be. Why not? Because everything that he says is possible in this universe must fit within the box. Let's just call it the box. In fact, if you can put up on the screen there uh, two, two boxes for me by way of illustration. Let's suppose that every natural law, every law of thermodynamics, the law of gravity, all the laws of biology, everything we know about the natural created world, let's say everything that we know has to fit into the box. All right? Now, the rational materialist says, look, if you want me to believe anything, it better be in this box. It better comport with the known laws of the universe. Uh, in fact, if it doesn't, then I can't believe it. Well, why? Because I'm an objective thinker. But hold on. The person who admits the possibility of the supernatural actually has more in his box than does the person who just has the box. Does this make sense? He's actually the more objective thinker, the one who at least admits the possibility of the supernatural. Because here he says, yes, I admit it, axe heads do not normally float in water. Blind men do not normally see again instantaneously. I understand that. But what if there is something outside of the known box that explains these things called the supernatural? Well, I would have you to believe that the person who admits the possibility of the supernatural explanation is actually more of, of an objective thinker than the person who just says, I operate only within the box. Does that make sense? Um, suppose a good friend of yours claims to have seen an angel. Now, I admit that that's unlikely. We don't, uh, we don't have angel DNA. 
Uh, nobody has ever been able to conclusively prove the existence of an angel, although a God's word says that they are. And not only that, but every major religion around the world uh, acknowledges angels. If somebody says to you, they, they come up to you, and they're a good friend, they're reliable, and they say, I think I've had an angelic encounter. Well, if you, all of you have is the natural box, the material box, then you have to say, I can't believe it. But if your box is at least open to supernatural possibility, then as an objective thinker, you can say to yourself, well, although I can't explain your encounter, I don't have the fingerprints or the DNA of an angel, I at least acknowledge the supernatural possibility that it may be. Which of the two thinkers is actually the more objective? Well, clearly the one who has the broader box. So what's the problem here? What's the problem? Well, the problem is simply this. The skeptic with his closed box, and it is just wrapped so tightly shut with his masking tape, the problem really isn't that his box is closed. The problem is that he's got something else that is closed. What is it? It's the mind But I'd take you one deeper and say that it runs even down to where? To the heart. You see, when when a person says that I can't believe the word of God because I can't believe in the kind of God that the Bible teaches, really at the very root of the problem, uh, you have the heart of the unbeliever who simply does not want there to be a God. He does not want there to be angels. He does not want there to be divine healings. He does not want axe heads to float on water. He does not want whales or fish to be able to swallow men. Why? Because he's got a God problem in his heart. If there is a God, as the Bible says that there is, that God is not a neutral God. The God of the Bible makes commands. The the God of the Bible makes demands. The God of the Bible has moral commands. The God of the Bible requires ethical commands. The God of the Bible requires obedience as a response. The God of the Bible requires worship as a response. The God of the Bible requires submission to his lordship as part of his domain as sovereign over the universe. And it's that, it's that, that the skeptic really wants no part of, you see? And so we can argue about fish if you want all day, and I'm game for that. But I, but I don't think that's always going to be helpful because deep down what the story of Jonah in his particularly chapter one, verse 17 says is simply this. God will have lordship confrontations with those who do not submit in obedience to his holy will. He will have lordship confrontations. Now, Jonah was a believer. He was. He was more than a believer. He was a prophet. He was a man with a calling and a mission. Unfortunately, in Jonah's life, he's in a period of rebellion and hypocrisy. We talked about that two weeks ago. But he is a believer. And so in all of our discussion on the possibility of a fish swallowing a man, we have not yet talked about why this happened. So I ask you now, let's turn the question, let's go to the corner here. Why did this happen in Jonah 1.17? Because God is having a lordship confrontation with his man Jonah. You see that? It's about obedience. It's about submission. And God is saying to Jonah, Jonah... Your disobedience will no longer be permitted here in my world. I am God of the mountains. I am God of the plains. I am God of the sea. You cannot run from me. And it's time for you and I to have an encounter. And in so doing, God sends a great fish. Is it possible that God created a unique creature, an absolutely unique creature, just perfectly for this occasion? Yes, that is completely possible. Do I know whether or not that happened? No, I don't know whether or not that happened, but it is possible. Matter of fact, the word appointed here uh, kind of reminds me of chapter 4 of the same book where it says in chapter 4, verse 6, Now the Lord God appointed 
a plant and made it come up over Jonah that it might be a shade over his head to save him from discomfort. And in this occasion, chapter 4, God seems to create some kind of a plant that has some other growth capabilities where it grows really fast and then God sends a, a worm in the next verse to destroy it. I don't know what kind of worm could do that. Maybe God created unique creatures just for that occasion too. I honestly don't know. But here's what I do know. We're going to call in an expert witness now to help wrap this up. You've heard a little bit from me, but let's go to the expert now. Let's turn our Bibles, if you will, to Matthew chapter 12. Bible's out. Pages open, Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Our expert witness that we'd like to consult this morning is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. What does Jesus have to say about this text? Well, here we go. Matthew chapter 12, verse 38. Then some of the scribes and the Pharisees answered him, saying, Teacher, we wish to see a sign from you. Now, pause right there. Um, Teacher, we want you to prove to us that you are who we say you are, or else we won't believe you. That's my paraphrase. Let's go on. But he answered them, an evil and adulterous generation seeks for a sign, but no sign will be given to it except for the sign of the prophet Jonah. Jesus says here, in essence, I don't play that game. I've already given a sign. It's the sign of Jonah. You remember him? So here Jesus is going to give us his teaching on this passage. For just as Jonah the prophet's Uh, was three days and three nights in the belly of the great fish, so will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. And now apparently Jesus thinks this literally happened here because he's making a direct comparison between the literal historical fact of Jonah's being swallowed by the great fish and his forthcoming death and resurrection, which also is about to be literally and historically fulfilled. Verse 41 The men of Nineveh will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, something greater than Jonah is here. The queen of the south will rise up at the judgment with this generation and condemn it, for she came from the ends of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. Behold, something greater than Solomon is here. Who is greater than Jonah, church? Christ. Who is greater than Solomon, church? Christ is greater than Solomon. He is greater than Jonah. When asked for a sign, when asked for proof, when asked for compelling argument that certainly proves who he was, who he said to be, Jesus simply turned to those who asked him and he said, I'm sorry, but I don't play that game. Why not? One sign. Well, the Bible is filled with signs. The life of Jesus was filled with signs. He healed. He preached. He multiplied loaves. He walked on water. Jesus did a multitude of signs. If those aren't enough, then what would finally be enough for you? Jesus says, look, Jonah was swallowed by a whale. He spit him up onto the land three days later. Is that not enough for you? Jesus says, and he turns to the skeptics, and he says, look, um, We can't play this game because the the problem with the skeptic is simply this. No matter what evidence is summoned, it will not be enough for you. And isn't that true? Have you ever argued with somebody about the faith before? You ever been online on Facebook and somebody says something and you're like, nah, I shouldn't do it. Yeah, I'm going to do it. I'm going to tell them. And you tell them on Facebook. And and then what, what happens to the very next comment? Well, what about this over here? What about that? And then someone else chimes in. You, You can't even, sometimes you can't even argue. And you can't argue because why? Because deep down, they don't really want the answers to the questions they're asking. What deep down the problem is, is that the heart doesn't want to submit to the lordship claims of Christ. And Jesus says here in Matthew 12, there is one great sign in heaven and on earth that I am who I say I am. If you don't believe the loaves, if you don't believe the walking on water, if you don't believe the the divine healings, Here is a sign, I will die and be raised again. That is the sign. 
And if you're not willing to believe that, then we can argue about the esophagus of fish all day. But at the end of the day, we come back to this. Jesus Christ died on a cross for our sins and he was raised again to new life. If you believe that, then nothing else in this book is impossible. And by the way, before we, before we close out the sermon this morning, I just want to mention simply this. You know, when, when God sent that great fish, whatever it was, great whites, killer whale, uh, sperm whale, whatever it is, Jonah had to be absolutely terrified. By, I mean, can you imagine that? You ever been swimming in the ocean before and you, you feel a piece of seaweed and you're like, whoa, what was that, a shark? <laughs> Sometimes my kids, like, you know, their sand pail will go out like four feet into the water and I'm like, I'm not going in there. There's sharks in there, man. <laughs> Jonah had to be absolutely terrified when this creature that God God appointed opens up its jaws and swallows him whole inside of this living creature, whatever it was. Terrifying, right? You know, sometimes the sovereignty of God is terrifying. But when we read on to chapter 2 next week, what we're going to see is that most terrifying thing that Jonah could imagine in that moment being eaten alive was actually God's grace, wasn't it? Yes, it was. It was God's love, his grace, his mercy, this divine appointment, this creature that God sends was actually terrifying, yes. Loving, absolutely. This was the greatest act of mercy and love and compassion that God could send to Jonah in that moment. I want to tell you something. If you are the skeptic today, okay, we've had a good conversation, but if you are that skeptic and even part of you is saying, you know, I, I, I kind of even kind of want to believe, but I'm scared. Let me just let you know that God is so gracious and loving that he will overwhelm your fears with his love, and we're going to see that next week with Jonah's prayer, great prayer, glorious prayer from the belly of the great fish. So let's pray as we close out. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do love you and thank you for all things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for his death and his resurrection. Lord, if there would be anybody here who, even as I'm preaching today, is, is just arguing point for points about fish and, and water and, and esophaguses of, of fish and whales, Lord, if there's anybody here who is being drawn, may your Holy Spirit do that work. Lord, I, I am just a mortal in a and a fool at that. I cannot convert anybody. But Lord, your Holy Spirit draws people to saving faith through your grace. And I pray, O oh God, that you would be drawing people even here and now in this church. And we do love you and thank you in Christ's name and all God's people said, amen. Hey, let's go ahead and stand up as the body of Christ. We'll put a benediction on you as you go. Uh, if, uh, if you want to come and pray with the elders, we are going to have time to pray. Now, we do have a meeting after church for members. If you're not a member, you're free to come and observe the, the Presbyterian way. Very exciting stuff. Uh, but members have voice and vote. So if you're a member, we'd love for you to stay and, and hear the information that the elders have for you. We'll take a 10-minute break so you can go and grab your kids from the nursery or give them a granola bar or whatever you need to do with your kids or use the restroom. All that's fine. If you want to come up and get prayer with the elders, we'll use that same 10-minute break to have some prayer time. And then come on back in and we'll get started. And I promise the meeting will be expedient and we'll be out of here in about a half an hour, okay? Let's pray. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you and give you peace. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you with favor, love, and mercy in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and all God's children said, amen. amen. I love you. Thanks for being here.